probably turn my phone onto silent. Mm. <laughs> Unless you have a nice ring to ring, please. So, this is the WebRTC panel. Um, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to cover, but that's kind of the fun of a panel. Um, the only thing I'm really keen to try and find out about is what these experts think will be the future of WebRTC, short term, long term, in their own personal futures, whatever. Um, and, you know, if it turns into a retrospective, I'm also not too worried about that. So it's really an opportunity to hear from, from the experts what they think. So uh, given that it's Dan's conference, I think we should start with Dan. And, and what do you think is going to happen to WebRTC in the next few months, years, whatever? Well, I haven't done a talk yet, so um, I guess I should give a little bit of background on why I organized the conference in the first place. Um, so I'm, I'm a WebRTC dev who happens to do a load of VoIP work as well. Um, and I run a business called Nimble 8 Limited, and we do real-time communication consultancy. Um, so that's my day job, and then ComCom was just kind of for fun. Um, it turned less fun towards the end, but uh, that's in my closing speech later. Um, and so what was the question again, Tim? <laughs> so I'm kind of interested in, in, in what we think is going to change. Like, we've talked a lot about what's there now, and I don't, I'm not suggesting we should be looking 10 years into the future, but like a lot of people have been talking about, well, how are we going to make things better in terms of, uh, of improving the user experience or, or getting the last 2% to work? Or, or like, how's that process going to work? What, what do you think is going to change? And kind of, kind of extract the genius from you, your, all of your collective experience. But if that's not what you want to talk about, that's also fine. Provided no. it's WebRTC, I'm not too bothered. To be I honest. mean, so um, Microsoft came out with their ORTC stuff, um, and that, that was helpful slash unhelpful all at the same time. Um, if you're not aware, ORTC was this kind of separate thing that Microsoft did um, before they started implementing WebRTC. Um, and, and it's all around having finer control over, over things and, um, and being more developer friendly, I guess. So where do I see things kind of going in, in a developer-centric WebRTC way? Um, a lot of what ORTC brought to the table is being put into the, the consideration list. Um, slash has already been kind of put into um, the WebRTC draft as best it could be. Um, from a personal standpoint, yeah, I don't want to munge SDP anymore. I don't want SDP anymore, but it's kind of there. Um, I, I want nice developer-friendly APIs for everything. I, I want to be able to say set a bitrate on, on a connection and for it to be a method. I want it to be more developer-centric, more web developer-centric. I mean, WebRTC was kind of a web thing at the very beginning. It's, it's become much more than that now. Um, but a general web developer still finds it incredibly difficult to actually get started with WebRTC, let alone write an application with WebRTC. So um, where do I want it to go? I want it to get more, more easy to go and write something. Um, and, then, and then I want it to be more easy to be able to go and do those 2% of, of changes to connections and, and make, make connections more stable by altering things. And, and for that not to be magic with, with SDP munging that, that I really don't care about. You could ask me what, what all the things in the SDP in VoIP planned mean, and I can ish tell you. Um, if you ask me what all the things in SDP in WebRTC land are, I kind of get stuck because there's a ton of extra stuff and, and I, as a web developer, I don't care. I really don't care. So I, I guess for the sake of the recording and particularly the people on the live stream who may not have actually watched the whole conference, uh, you're right, we should be more professional and introduce ourselves. So L Lindsay, maybe you could like briefly introduce yourself and then perhaps um, I kind of answer the question or carry on from where Dan was about like 
APIs for web developers? Because you've kind of come into, into WebRTC relatively recently, and so kind of maybe have an interesting perspective on it from that point of view as well. Mm. Yeah, so uh, my name is Lindsay Haynes. Um, I work at Slack. I'm a software engineer on the video conferencing team. And yeah, I would agree with a lot of what Dan said. Um, first, making it easier to get started and making it easier to understand what's going on and having uh, really good documentation of what's going on. Um, and that final 5% of quality, how do we improve a quality of video call, audio call, screen share calls? How do we um, make the, f the frame rate better, the, um, the frame size better, that sort of thing. Getting more reliable calls so that they work all the time. That final 5% is a lot, lot harder than the first, first chunk, the first like 95%. So getting to a point where we can get over those final hurdles. Um, and I'm not sure how WebRTC is going to do it, but um, it'll be pretty cool to see. But, but do, you, do you feel as a developer you want to be in like total control of the detail of that, or do you expect that WebRTC will solve that final 5% for you, or do you think it's a bit of a mix? I think it's a bit of a mix. Okay. Like As we wait, things get better, um, and as we develop and get better at tooling and measuring things, our service gets better as well. So it's, I think it's a mix of both. So, Lorenzo. Yeah, I'm with me production for me as well. So, um, Please, yeah. <laughs> I'm Lorenzo Miniero and I'm mostly famous for my slides against pineapple on pizza and, and more in general on Janus and WebRTC stuff. So more, uh, when I think about WebRTC and where do I see it in the future, I'm more, more than on the technical side of things, I'm more interested in the use cases because especially at the beginning if you think about it, uh, WebRTC was from many people in the, in the industry, seen mostly as, ah, I have a nice way for, for contacting my IVR from the browser, for instance. So still a very legacy perspective on use cases rather than seeing WebRTC uh, in the big picture. So all the new things that you could do with WebRTC. And this is starting to happen more and more every year. And you see it, it's being used in healthcare or all other things. So it's, WebRTC is now in pretty much every device out there in the wild. You can, take an old phone that you're not using anymore, an old Android phone, for instance, and use it as a surveillance camera in your home, push the video somewhere, process it, and do whatever you want with it. And this is where I see WebRTC uh, actually uh, growing in the future, because even the reluctance to, adapt, to adopt WebRTC right now has started to fade. So up until a few years ago, people were still worried that WebRTC was unstable because it was changed. It's still, it is still changing. Uh, in a very dynamic way from time to time in browsers, but it has become more and more stable as time passed and it has convinced more and more people to, to start adopting it. So I see uh, even more people starting to use it and even more use cases to start appearing in the future. So uh, when I think it from a techno technological perspective, I, I really want to, to just allow it to still keep the same level of flexibility and possibly the same level of interoperability that it has allowed us to, to use. Because right now you can use WebRTC together with a lot of different applications uh, that may or may not use the same subset of the protocols and so on. And so as long as that keeps on going, I'm, I'm happy. Iñaki. Okay. So I am in, uh, Iñaki Bath. Uh, I come from the VIP world in, we, in which uh, I, will, I spent many years. I also built uh, some SIP, SIP implementations. And now I am, for the last three, four, or even five years, I am, work, I am working in WebRTC. So I think I have a bit uh, a knowledge in, in both worlds. Um, okay, so what I see looking at the history of WebRTC is that. Uh, this is a seven, I don't know, six or seven years old uh, specification. Um, I remember at the beginning that we had to fight against people that at the AETF, uh, they wanted uh, to impose, to force uh, the browsers to speak uh, a signaling protocol. Uh, uh, in fact, in, uh, they were proposing that the browsers uh, should speak C protocol. Okay. We had to fight it. Finally, I think we won. Uh, but we lost the battle when it comes to using SDP as a 
uh, as the way to signal anything else. So, I remember people at the beginning of the WebRTC history that uh, were proposing that browsers so, uh, should also have uh, a history, uh, a, ca a call history. Uh, okay, just, just for you to know, the, the browser is not a phone. <laughs> okay, and there are uh, communications ways um, others than just uh, making a, a call from one to, to, to another. So, in, in all these years, I have seen uh, the most brilliant uh, minds in, in RTC, in real-time communications, uh, discussing things like uh, DT, DTMF for WebRTC, discussing SDP semantics and params, uh, a very slow... Sorry? Facts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Facts. <laughs> okay. Uh, and overall, uh, the specification, uh, it was really, really, really uh, slow because uh, the discu the, there were discussions between different gra uh, groups in the IETF. Uh, so, for example, if at WebRTC we need uh, to, si to signal some kind of RTP param, we need the approval and, and a specification from the M Music group. And then there is also the AV Core group. And so it's something that uh, at the end we have the most bri uh, brilliant uh, minds discussing about things that are just uh, cosmetic. They and they give uh, no value. So what I expect for WebRTC next generation is go as much low level as possible, uh, do it even complex, because even if it is complex, there, there will be people providing JavaScript libraries on top of the native APIs that will make things uh, simple. So just don't, don't try to do uh, high level APIs. Instead, do complex, very low level APIs and let then the people fight uh, with them, uh, play, uh, release uh, libraries that does stuff, simplify stuff, and, and that's, uh, and that's uh, what I expect and what I hope for the future. Before we move on, uh, Iñaki talking about browsers, um, it, it kind of dawned on me that WebRTC itself can't actually move on much more in terms of user interface and, and making those 5% of things easier when when the browser is still kind of a second-class citizen in terms of having better control over things. I mean, getting access to a camera has been far easier recently, but we, we've still got into this bad... Um, I, I can open up, uh, I can open up uh, like FaceTime and Skype at the same time, and they both get access to my camera, fine. But as soon as I ask for two of the same stream of camera from in my browser, I suddenly get told, no, you can't do that. Um, and then I have to deal with that from a user perspective. The user doesn't care that another tab's already using my camera and already using my microphone. So the browser kind of needs to get more, more of a native um, permissions perspective. And that's kind of half coming with the advances of progressive web apps and, and what that kind of opens up to us further on down the road. Um, but it's there's a two-way part here. There's, there's WebRTC and there's, and there's getting finer control over things and, and being able to actually deal with things without munching SDP and things like that. But then there's also OS level type things within, within the browser. There's a reason why loads of people build Electron apps with WebRTC. And it's not because of stability, it's because people like native feel but we love building web applications, so we chuck web applications into Electron. Yeah. So that uh, actually, that was going to be the next question. So we're like, Sorry. we're in the right. No, it, absolutely, <laughs> it saves me the effort. Um, but but so so Lindsay, like, based on what Dan's just said, this kind of thing about Electron versus versus the web, like, do you? Do you have a secret preference for like, oh, I'm much happier with dealing with the Electron app because I'm really in control of it, mm -hmm. or the packaging is such a pain, I'd rather push it onto the web. Like, do you have a, like a, a preference there, or do you not care? Well, with the, with the browser, we get the, the newest, latest version of Chrome. So that's um, a big plus, so that there might be more bug fixes, there might be better, um, uh, better quality for our users. Um, Chrome's just uh, faster to test on. Um, Electron's a little bit harder to write 
test for or um, quickly spin up something to test um, something you're working on. So I like working in the browser, although Electron gives us native features that we need, like for interactive screen sharing, we need to be able to control another user's screen. So we're doing a lot of that there for Electron, so we need that. Um, we can't do that in the browser, so having both is nice. No strong, that, well, that's a yeah. mixed preference. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. And, and so, I mean, do, 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 do you, I, I was just trying to think about whether, whether we agree with Inyaki's point about like being low level is fine because it'll get covered with JavaScript libraries. Or do, does that just like add to the confusion of the, the new web developer who suddenly realizes that he's not only have they got to like get hold of this new technology, but they've got to choose which library to use. Now, Lorenzo, do you think that's like a fair, fair thing or? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it really depends on what ends up going on, on the wire, I guess, most of the time. So, uh, and which also relates partly to my point about interoperability before. So eventually, uh, no matter the APIs, no matter how you are going to, to signal stuff and so on, there's still stuff that is going to travel over the wire. In, right now it's uh, SRTP and, and other stuff and so on. And so, of course, uh, going as low level as possible, also in terms of encoding properties and so on, may be a very good idea in order to give proper control and stuff like this. About, there is a danger, yeah, about uh, whenever APIs start to pop up and providing higher level access to functionality and so on, to, let's say, make it easy to make calls, make it easy to do some other things and so on, and the low level APIs being so difficult to learn possibly, there is the risk of those higher level APIs becoming the de facto standard for doing things, which means that you end up um, with many applications doing way less than they could, could possibly could, because of course the, the moment that you start developing higher level APIs, you start constraining what you can actually take advantage of in, uh, if you, had ac if you sta started playing with the lower level stuff as well. This is most what I'm mostly concerned about, but in principle, I'm not uh, a web developer first myself. I'm most, more, more concerned about the server side myself, of course, because that's what, what I'm involved in. But I don't know if this really answers your question or not. So. OK, I, I think that uh, this is like uh, maybe jQuery example, yeah. in which uh, some years ago, um, many web developers were using jQuery because it was the easiest, the easiest way, way, way to go. Uh, um, but it doesn't prevent uh, uh, to, to others from making something new. And mm -hmm. nowadays, we are using some web uh, frameworks that uh, don't use uh, jQuery anymore. And I think people is fine with them, like React or Vue, or I don't know how to say Vue. Uh, so I don't think that having something that is really low level is a problem in the future, because at least it can be changed. Mm -hmm. So even, it, even if there is a very su a successful uh, high-level API library that people will use, um, probably in a Stack Overflow you will have questions about it rather than the low-level native API. But it's something that can be changed, and you are free to use it or, or not. And if you if you are a, a, an expert developer and you know the specification, you can do funny things without caring about the, the existing library. So I just interested in as much level, low level uh, as possible, better. Yeah, no, I tend to agree with that. I mean, I w my concern was mostly just from, from the fear yeah, that those, <laughs> those higher level libraries may eventually take over more than they should and uh, eventually become the, the actual reference, reference implementation considerations for people that, that try to tackle it and then people say, this is actually not what I need. Uh, mm. Maybe I mean, what practice is not for me and stuff like it's that. It's no different to the situation that we're in today we all use adapter.js. Yeah. Every single, well, you, you're a little bit different, Tim. <laughs> but I tried to use, I tried not to use adapter.js probably I five months ago. I don't I, and I thought, oh, well, we're, we're almost at a point where the spec is there and the browsers are pretty good now. And, and surely for this really basic WebRTC app, I don't need to use adapter.js. I got half an hour in and just, loaded in adapter.js because it was too complex. There was too much crap and things didn't work the way that they should work. Um, so today, all web developers who build stuff with WebRTC use adapter.js. And if they're not, they should. Um, other than Tim, because Tim's a special case. Um, but 
yeah, I mean, we all use React as web developers, or we use Vue, or, or we use a framework of some description. I've got absolutely no problem with the IETF and the W3C deciding on a very low level API where people can then write shim, not shims, frameworks on top of them. Um, and we can, use, we can use that and we can adapt it. We can adapt a framework far, far quicker than the W3C and the IETF can change something. I think Lorenzo's point, which I actually, stepping off my, my podium here, but I'm slightly set aside, um, is that Lorenzo's point was about the wire protocol. That like, if you want the interoperability, then at least you have to preserve the wire protocol from, like, isolate it from changes. Otherwise, you'll get Firefox not working with a native app that you compiled six weeks ago, and that, that's I think that's a serious risk. Yeah, um, yeah. But or, or I mean, <coughs> the other thing we're starting to see is like people are tuning firewalls to permit stuff through, and if you start changing the wire protocol then that stops working. So like, you know, suddenly XYZ Bank doesn't get their Slack through because somebody's changed the wire protocol. And that, so I think there's a, like that, uh, that aspect I want to preserve. Mm -hmm. But, um, but so I, I'm interested in, in, in what you said about adapter.js because there's a presumption that actually we're talking about JavaScript here. And, and, and what we've heard from several of the speakers, I mean, the Facebook speaker in particular, and, and I think the Google one as well, like that actually this is dominantly a mobile play and actually that's native at the moment. And I'm curious to know whether any of you feel like, I mean, I do, but I, I think, again, I'm a special and possibly wrong case, but whether people feel that the native, that people will build things for mobile on the browser basis, whether that's something like, uh, can you imagine a Slack client in the browser on mobile, or, or like you know, one of the apps that you've been building in the past? Like, has anybody kind of imagined themselves doing that today? No, um, I've got loads of clients that that would love to have a web interface that, like a progressive web app, that gets installed onto the user's home screen and, and it acts like a native app as far as installing it and things like that. Um, and, and there's cool things coming possibly in the, in the short term where you might be able to go and discover a progressive web app in a app store and so it's exactly the same as a native app. However, um, a native app will 100% every single time give you a much better experience than than a web app on mobile, 100% of the time. And so if you, take, if you take a mobile experience seriously, you're going to have a native app right now. Absolutely, I want it to get better. Um, it's going to get better on Android, inevitably with, with what progressive web apps and where Google are taking that. But we've still got iOS devices and, and they're kind of the larger, um, larger percentage, aren't they? So, um, native is never going to go away, and and so if you're building a native app, whether or not it's like with React Native or or, or whether or not it's actually properly native, um, you're you're always going to build a native app because of iOS at the moment. That's my personal view. You agree? You agree with that? Um, I'm just thinking of the Slack mobile app. I mean, people use the Slack mobile app for. Slack purposes and then um, keeping it within there is the easiest for them. Um, because we focus on a tool for work, we've been focusing on not mobile but um, for laptop usage because we've assumed that people are going to be doing their work on their laptops, so we've been focusing less on mobile and actually more on um, desktop. So mm -hmm. in the short term, n no, the focus isn't so much on mobile right now. Yeah, I mean, in, I mean uh, hybrid applications have been around for a while though, so there have been frameworks to try and combine native functionality and web functionality to make it easier to design your application and still take advantage of some lower level stuff in a native way. I mean, you're, you had a plugin that was Cordova, something like this, which is, was supposed to make it easier to integrate WebRTC stuff into, uh, into mobile applications by still keeping it as a 
as a web web driven process. So I it's probably not as efficient right now as it should be. As uh, probably not as efficient as a as a native mobile application. But I see this probably going going on. I'm not. I I was a mobile developer myself a few years ago. I started to move a bit away from that, but. Even at the time, there was people were using this a lot. So, using uh, web design in order to, to design your own application and then taking advantage of native features, which in this case might be all the video and audio functionality integrated into uh, a web page, either by faking web views or stuff like that. I really would like to have a, a WebRTC in mobile, in browser, in mobile, a first WebRTC class. Um, there are some use cases that, uh, for which uh, is very useful. That just imagine that you are building your super WebRTC cool conference uh, enterprise application. So it's very easy to provide, to invite others, your customers or, or providers that uh, are not within your organization. So you don't have, uh, like in Slack or, or something like that, in which you, you all have the same application installed. So you share then uh, just a link using the email, for example, and they can join using the a desktop in the web, and it works. But in mobile, it's not like that because uh, they should uh, install an application that is not always possible, uh, or they must uh, open the browser in mobile. And unfortunately, it's a use case that uh, it should work, right? Because I think there is a lot of uh, benefit and use cases for it, but it doesn't work. You cannot keep a call in the browser um, for long because as far as you put your mobile near to you um, the application go goes to background, the, the sockets are closed, you, you, you cannot keep the web socket connection open, you cannot keep sending uh, web, uh, audio and video sometimes. So I think there are use cases for it but depending on the nature of, the, of each application. For example in, in Slack it's obvious that the, uh, the best thing to do is just install the app and you are done. But there are other use cases that are not, are not covered right and now. I tend to agree with that. Dan and I worked on a, a thing that we actually basically we wanted people to use casually. And, and, uh, and in that case, you could send a link and you could, people could open that link in their, in their iOS or Android phone and it would in theory work. We struggled to get it to work reliably, which is an, like a story, but but in principle, the idea of being able to send a link for casual one-off use uh, means that you don't have to do an install. And I think maybe even in the Slack case, the idea of like having a, a guest to a conference, so somebody who isn't necessarily a member of your Slack group, but who you want to invite as an expert in or something like that. I think that's a... Um, oh yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. Option, I mean, though. web mobile has its place with WebRTC, completely and utterly. But from a real... I use this thing every day perspective. I've got Slack installed as an app. I don't have Slack as a progressive web app or, or saved to my home screen or anything. I've got it as an app because I like the fact that it gives me different notifications. I like the fact that it ties into everything that it should do. I like the fact that it wakes up my phone when I get a Slack call and it just appears. That wouldn't happen with the, the web version. Like, it's great. Web on mo web, um, sorry, web RTC on mobile web has its place right now, but it's not for a, a proper app experience. Right. Okay. Interesting. So I thought, looking at the time, we have six minutes. Oh, we've got. We we, we can go on a little bit more. Right? Well, maybe we'll take a few questions and see cool. see if, if see if anybody's got questions and if they and. Then we can wander off into other topics if if we like. I think that's on. Hi. Uh, so uh, I'd like to be contrarian that um, one, I'm I'm not a web developer, and we are from a company that makes old school C based, uh, you know, really small things. Um, and I really don't actually like the everything's moving to the browser, and I like the browser have its place and so forth. Like, I, I use Gmail, but reluctantly, because there's no native client, for example, um, things like that. And, and, and I don't like Electron apps, like the GitHub desktop, or even Slack. I use, we use Slack, but again, uh, grudgingly, uh, because they're like, I like, it's running five browser apps, 
um, in, in, in my Mac, for example, rather than the old native app, which is small, um, uh, less memory, and all that sort of stuff. So that's just my thought. Again, so if someone ever thought of having a nat uh, uh, Android app or an iOS app that is basically running Chrome every time, then I'm, I'm not for it. Oh, no. I, I mean, I, I completely get that. I mean, from a, from a development perspective, it, may, it makes absolute perfect sense to write your code as, as within the web and then, and then try and make a native experience using, say, Electron or using React Native, for example. I mean, you can write the code once and you get 90% of the way there. Um, there are less and less um, native developers out there and there are more and more web developers out there. So it's also cheaper and so you write once instead of what six or seven times for different platforms um, and then and then it's cheaper as well because you're, you're hiring a web developer instead of uh, instead of five different native developers for different platforms. So I don't think we're going to ever get away from the web being a, a great programmable interface um, in the future. Um, but we, we have to make that web experience better um, so that you don't have to run um, Electron apps, for example, which are just V8 in multiple, multiple times. And so if you end up with 10 Electron apps and it ends up taking a load of memory from your machine, um, we need to get better at that. Um, so that we're not kind of relying on this kind of halfway house. The web, in my opinion, the web should be king um, and, and we need to get to a better place where that can be the case. Anyone else want to pick up on that point? No, I'm, I'm, I, I think I pretty much made <laughs> 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 it. No. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it makes sense. I mean, uh, WebRTC was uh, was conceived in the first place because there was a huge proliferation of uh, system-specific, platform-specific plugins in the first place. You wanted to implement an uh, audio-video application, you had to use the Adobe plugin, uh, Java app, like oh, over there. Flash, and yeah. yeah, and you Actually, needed that's... you needed something for any specific. So if you wanted to write your own plugin, you had to target a macOS plugin, a Linux plugin, or maybe even diff different distros plugin. A uh, plugin for Windows, then do it for 34 bits, 64 bits, and so on. So, WebRTC in the browser frees us from all that. So, you're sure that you just need to write your application. It, it's a web application, it's supposed to work everywhere. No matter, who, no matter which browser you're using, it's supposed to work. So, I definitely welcome a world where actually the browser is, is able to, to make your applications work in a seamless way and in an efficient way as well. As well, as well. Because otherwise, yeah, we, we go back exactly to the same plugin-based problem. So we need to write, again, a native application on different system. We need to target, again, Windows, again, Mac OS, again, Linux, and so on and so forth, which is bringing us back. I mean, it's definitely more efficient, and there are cases where it's actually needed for, for one reason or another. But I mean. I think there's a, uh, another point, which is one of the reasons why WebRTC happened, and you started to kind of hint on that, was, was around security. Yeah. Like, you know, both Flash and Java in the browser were disastrously insecure. Mm -hmm. and, and the ability to, part of the driving force of, of doing WebRTC from the point of view of the browser companies, was the ability to switch off Flash and Java. And, and that, uh, I think, I think that's been maybe to some extent forgotten, the level of protection that the browser gives well, you. It 100% has been because, I mean, people now build apps using Electron because Electron, you're, you're, lim you're, you're stuck to a V8 <laughs> version. And so it's entirely up to the person that builds that Electron app to then update to a new version of Electron. So the fact that you're now publishing this app out there and you're still tied to this could be insecure version of V8 and, and everything with WebRTC, it has completely been forgotten. From un unless you build a proper web app that only lives in the web, it's completely been forgotten. It's the same for, for native. You can just stick on an old um, WebRTC branch or whatever from, from WebRTC.org and you don't get any of that new secure stuff. I, I don't think we've really had any crazy things that we've had to patch really but yet yet 
Um, but, but someday it will happen, and at, at which point all of these electron apps and all of these native apps, well, they're going to be insecure. Um, so we, we, we have forgotten about it completely. There's the flip of the coin to that as well, though, because, uh, of course, security and privacy and all the kind of things are things that we want, but may also be an obstacle to taking advantage of all the features we may want. So take the, the Slack application, for instance. They are able to do uh, remote control functionality within the Electron app because they are able to do that from, from a native perspective. I, I don't expect remote control to, to probably ever, ever, to ever be available into, in, yeah. the, in the web application. So that may be something that uh, will prevent some features that people may want to, mm -hmm. to have uh, be available in the browser, which means that uh, it will never be something that will cover all the scenarios that are out there. I, f I feel like we've used Slack as an example for Way too much. Far yeah. too much. <laughs> <laughs> there are other Electron apps out there that do loads yeah. of other things. Yeah, well, I mean, I've worked on one, so yeah. Um, and actually, I mean, I think, I think that whole um, that whole aspect of, and even on the on mobile, it's the whole aspect of insecurity. I think is a like the native apps aren't necessarily going to be perfectly secure. We have a question oh from no, the floor. Uh -oh. That's hey, going to uh -oh. be a difficult question. <laughs> no, it's not a difficult question. Uh, so I've co I contribute to a lot of standards, W three C and IDF, and there's a uh, saying there that we need to protect the web developers from. Uh, complexity so that we don't give them a shotgun to shoot them in, <laughs> in the <laughs> foot uh, or feet or I don't know, like others' feet. Uh, what do you guys think? When w we as web developers, um, we are just as good a developer as a, a native developer. I mean, we should give you the shotgun. So you should absolutely give us the shotgun. I mean, yeah. there, we, we do loads and loads of other work elsewhere where we could mess up entirely. We, most web developers now are quote full stack developers, uh, whatever that really means now. Um, and, and there's nothing stopping me not hashing and salting a password in a database and then that database being leaked. There's nothing stopping that. I can go and do that. I can go shoot myself in the foot. That's my fault. Like, don't baby us. Don't try and protect us. Um, treat us as equals um, and maybe maybe you'll get more web developers trying to help on the mailing list and things like that. I have a tremendous respect for anyone who can understand CSS. So like, you know, <laughs> if you can, if you can <laughs> grok CSS then SDP is probably relatively easy actually. I mean, it, actually, you, you'd be in an interesting position because like you've sort of, like we all graduated, well I graduated a very long time ago before any of this was invented. But what were you taught in, in, in college that was relevant to what you're doing now? Or is there like the big distinction? Um, I did a lot of C programming in university. Um, and I actually really like the low level stuff because it doesn't feel so magical. So that when you're learning something new, you're like, okay, it's not just one thing that I, I type or one command and like a bunch of stuff happens. It's like each small thing you're learning about it in depth because it's now it's not magical now I understand actually what's going on and that's why I really like C because I was like okay I understand where the memory is going and I understand where I like open up a port or that sort of thing and that so you, you'd actually again you're echoing to basically what Dan's saying which yeah. is treat the treat the developer with respect give them the tools and let them get on with the job mm -hmm. so that, like and but ideally in C from your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> can I start sending you some C work <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so this is not a million miles away from the previous question, but I, I love Dan's comment. I think it was Dan's comment about, um, you know, as developers can shim any API a million times quicker than the ITF and W3C can, can agree anything. Um, with that in mind, will WebRTC2 ever, oh, ever happen and should it? <laughs> I will 2.0 ever happen and shoot it. No <laughs> Did someone else want this? No. No? Um, <laughs> no is the short answer, I don't think. I mean, we're seven years in and we still don't have a proper specification that is actually a specification. Um, is <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to disagree with that. How, how many years ago did I, I... I went to a conference in Canada, I think three years ago, 
and I said, we're almost there. I'd be surprised. <laughs> I'd be surprised if we don't have something like almost there by six months time. And that was three years ago. Um, there's too many, there's too many people that have too many ideas and opinions and um, we, I, I completely get it. WebRTC hasn't finished yet. Like WebRTC 1.0 has not finished yet, but we're, we're already talking about WebRTC 2.0. And I completely get it. You've got to start thinking about the future. And, but I mean, come on, like let's finish what we started first um, and get on with it. So I'm, I'm going to agree with that, but I would like just to defend the standards people because I wasted a lot of my life in that, that area. It is now possible to implement at least the wire protocol entirely from the specification. Like you can write something that's based on the specification that implements the wire protocol and it will interoperate with all of the browsers. And that is like, that never used to happen. Right. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, though you... Get a, like five cents in. <laughs> well, uh, no, go, go for it, go, go, go for it. We'll um, so I was going to ask, with reasonable cross-browser support now for web components, I just wondered how you see the future of um, web components uh, helping to enable web developers to, to produce web RTC applications much quickly, yeah, much more quickly and easily. Uh, components. Uh, yeah, they, they, to, to me, they, they, they're very different and, and we, we would never get to... You can't really just bring in a web component that does this magical thing um, with WebRTC for me. Um, I don't think that, that would ever really work. Um, again, it's kind of dumbing down. It's going back to this, oh, you can bring in this thing and it, and it works. That's, that's great from a, from a graphical perspective. Like, I love web components from a, I can, bring in, I can bring in a UI that I like and I can bring in material design and, and I, as a non-designer, I can actually make something that, that actually looks pretty nice. Um, but I don't think we'd ever get to a point where uh, component, web components would really enable WebRTC better than we have today. Yeah? I, I think there are too much use cases to simplify them within a few web components or user interface. So there are use cases in which you don't ever realize that you are using a WebRTC application. Like when some well-known websites are tracking you using WebRTC data channel and taking your IP and your private IP, so I don't think a web component fits very well in that use case, for example. Okay, I'm going to just defend the standards as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the author of one of them, so you kind of have Actually, to. Actually, a lot of them, but uh, 14 in total. Oh. But, uh, but uh, I was in the room when they decided to do WebRTC. And I remember why we did it, because we believed that we knew how to do that, right? And I remember the specific reason was we knew how to do it because we had STP. Right. So the reason that STP is in the API was because we thought that was going to be somehow in the API. We did not think it would be part of the attribute that gets passed into an API, but people thought, at that time that because we knew STP and how we knew how to describe things in STP, we would do it. Of course, a lot of people in the room did not agree and thought that, th uh, that using the standards process would be able to convince people who wanted to do STP not to do STP. Um, that turned out difficult. Uh, <laughs> and, but the good thing about the standards at that point was that if you wanted to do RTP in 2009, 10, or 11, you could do it in a myriad of ways. And if you wanted to do anything with RTP, it was really difficult because there were set up boxes, there were uh, people doing cable TV, people were doing MPEG-2 over stuff. So one of the things that WebRTC actually did was create a profile for all the protocols that we have today. So even STP, though we hate it so much, now we have one way of describing something. That might be unified plan, maybe, in the end. Right. Uh, but you could just veer off of it, right? You could do like 100 things on it. Yeah, I, d I don't think any of us dislike this, the end result. Um, no, it, I dislike the end result, it, but. It's, it's, well, yeah, I don't like SDP, and I don't like a ton of stuff that made its way in because, because WebRTC became about making phone calls, for example. 
Um, there's a ton of other ways to use WebRTC um, that don't even include media, um, as you know. Um, but what was I going to say? Um, no, my mind's gone. Um, we all hate the we, 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 API. We don't necessarily yeah, we, we don't necessarily disagree with you with the end result. It's the time that it takes to get there. Um, it's the bureaucracy. Um, it's it's the fact that um, I don't feel comfortable um, being kind of vocal on the mailing list and being being a part of that um, because I don't feel like I know enough and therefore. And therefore, I my voice is lesser. D does that make sense? No, I do understand um, it. And, 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 and so, if if clever people, because there are lots of clever people on that mailing list and who make decisions, could just give us the tools, really low level to do it, etc., and then then that would be far better. Uh, One hundred percent. This was brand new, and, and that's why so much telephony stuff got kind of ended up in WebRTC. Um, completely get it. Um, we're not new anymore. Um, let's try and make a better job of it second time round, but it doesn't really look like that's going to happen. I would deeply, deeply resent going through this whole process again. Like it was painful enough the first time round. No. And, and I think the other thing that it's easy to forget, and you shouldn't, is that there are two and a half billion endpoints which all speak the same protocol and all have the same API. And that is just like, well, that has literally never happened before. Like, and that's to do with the standard process. Like the fact that I can do peer-to-peer, end-to-end, encrypted communication between any two of those end, oh, two and a half billion endpoints is an enormous victory. Yeah. Like, uh, and, 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 like, for all of the grief that it's caused, like that is a, um, no, that's the thing, it's probably the thing I'm most proud of actually, I mean, you know, yeah, in the work life. But the point is that you don't need to specify or to make a standard the SDP as the only way to communicate such a param. You can do that uh, on a, a specification on top of that. For example, you can use currently zip on the browser by using WebSocket as a transport and there's a specification for that. But you are not constraining the browser to just speak SIP. You, you, this, the browser just uh, implements uh, web sockets and you are free to send whichever you want on top of web socket. So just build a specification that uh, carries SIP messages on top of a web socket and you are done. The same for SDP. You don't need to transport uh, SDP as it is. You may take the low level patterns. Uh, I think to I totally agree with it. I think, uh, I think we forget that when we made that compromise very early on, that SDP was part of the equation uh, when that compromise was made. And then once the compromise was made, it was really hard to kick out that compromise because it would overturn a lot of the, because when we started WebRTC, we said we'll do it in two years. So this is 2012 when we said we'll do it in 2014 because we know all the moving parts, which was we were naive, right? We would not, like IETF would not have said green to this work if someone did not go and say some ridiculous statement like that. So right? we're kind of, I like think this is a really good conversation for over beer, but I think it doesn't cover the future enough and we've already overrun by yes. 13 minutes. So I think I'm going to thank the panel, say if you've got any last words you want to say, say them now. No, I think I've said everything that I needed to say. <laughs> Lindsay? Yeah. Else? Right, well, so <laughs> I'm going to thank the panel for, for, like, for their, their time and effort and for their and wisdom and, and catch them later. I mean, and thank you, Tim. Yeah. And thank you very much. <laughs>